Yeah, I'm Manjur Samar Singh. We are very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you are all welcome to the panel discussion on inspection and maintenance of flooded drop tunnels with 3D solar tailored ROVs. Ladies and gentlemen, you may aware like uh, other engineering structures, tunnels also need to be inspected. According to accurate data on the structural integrity of submerged tunnels as well as shaft, has long been a challenging and uh, costly problem. So inspection and are difficult generally uh, and time consuming due to uh, dewatering procedures and dewatering also is uh, difficult sometimes. Uh, so because of that, we need to have uh, technologies like ROVs. This discussion basically covers the ROV applications and tunnel inspection. With this purpose, uh, this discussion is organized by the Water Forum at the Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka in collaboration with American Society of Engineers Sri Lanka International Group and the Sri Lanka Association of Institution of Civil Engineers. So, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Chairman Water Forum, Engineer Mrs. Badra Kamaladasa and the Water Forum Committee, I formally welcome the uh, resource personnel today. Uh, Dr. Andrew Rizma is joining from Sweden. Mr. Maiko Simola from uh, joining from Finland, and today the moderator. Uh, the discussion is engineer Dr. Kamal Laksiri, and you are warmly welcome, sir. And uh, warmly welcome those who are joining with us in this evening, and those who are joining with from OSIS as well. Ladies and gentlemen, the Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka is the FX national body of professional engineers in the country, having the membership of more than 20,000. The water forum or the water arm of the institution is doing a significant role to promote and propagate the concept of integrated water resources management and to facilitate, facilitate the innovations, technology development for conservation of management of water resources by adapting the best practice, practices. Most imp importantly, the Water Forum extends the support to the government and other regulatory bodies to evolve and make professional standard policies, recommendations in the field of development of respective areas. Okay, let's uh, carry on the discussion, ladies and gentlemen. I wish to give a brief introduction of the resource personnel today. Please join me in recognizing first, Dr. Andrew Zrizma is joining from Sweden. He's an expert geologist on rock engineering. Andrew Zrizma obtained his PhD from Calgary in 2007. In 2007, he uh, worked at Sweden. Geological survey as a field geologist. 2008 engaged as a consultant with the role as the project technical manager, expert in geology and rock tunnel engineering to the client as Sweden Swedish Transport Administration. 2014 to 2020, Andrew Surisma has been head of the Department of Infra Design and Rock Engineering. Locus Consulting was founded by Andrew. Rizma in 2020. Then uh, we have to recognize the presence of Michael, Mr. Michael Simula from Finland. Yes, hello. He's a, pioneer. He's a pioneer of ROV technology for flooded tunnels, has over 25 years experience, first with, uh, first with the Coast Guard working in underwater operations at the as the head of maritime research and later as the CEO and owner of Locus. The majority of his works at uh, Locus has involved inspection and maintenance of flooded tunnels, as well as seabed survey, harbor and offshore industry. This network includes geological, biological and archaeologist and experts in underwater infrastructure. Ladies and gentlemen, today the moderator, engineer Dr. Kamal Laksiri, the project director, broaden project, and uh, he has 30 years in ex uh, experience in hydro hydropower and dam engineering. Former vice president of the Institution of, Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka, then member of the Strategic Council, International Water Association, past president, Association of Consulting Engineers Sri Lanka, executive committee member, FEDIC. Vice President, Sri Lanka National Committee on Large Dams, Chairman, Sri Lanka Association of the Institution of Civil Engineers, UK, 
immediate past chairman voted for a MISN and uh, recently he was honored as the governor of the American Society of Civil Engineers USA for the term 21st to 24th. With this background, ladies and gentlemen, let's carry on. I wish to invite today the moderator, Engineer Dr. Kamal Laksiri, to proceed the discussion. Dr. Kamal Laksiri, over to you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Manjula, for the nice introduction. Uh, yeah. Good evening to all of you. Um, so this uh, interesting presentation on inspection and maintenance of flooded block tunnels with 3D sonar tailored ROV. So today and this evening, we are going to discuss about the application of ROV technology. Uh, it's a bit new to us, but uh, it's being practiced in the other parts of the world. And to discuss on this topic so with us today, uh, we are joined with two Nordic experts, like Dr. Andrea Crimson and uh, Mik Mikko Simola. So, uh, yeah. on behalf of the organizers, we warmly welcome both of you to this event today. Uh, Dr. Andrea is joining from Stockholm, Sweden, and uh, Mikko is joining from Helsinki, Finland, as I learned. So in this afternoon, we will uh, mainly focus on the need to inspect water tunnels and also the application of ROV uh, based on your experience. I think uh, it will be very useful for our engineers and the other participants who are joining today. Um, if I just uh, mention a few things now, like any other engineering construction, tunnels are also need to be maintained and uh, to ensure they are uh, successful operation during the planned lifetime. Normally, we plan a tunnel uh, for 50 to 75 years. Now, in this country, we have uh, railway tunnels older than 100 years and water tunnels older than uh, 50 years. So, but they, if you look at in the case of railway and highway tunnels, of course, uh, they are straightforward. They need maintenance work, inspections you can do anytime. But if, in the case of water tunnels, it's not that easy. Because for, a, for an inspection, you need to do, go for a dewatering. And then dewatering is the most critical part, I think. You all uh, dealing with the tunnels, you know that because the tunnels have to be dewatered in a controlled manner. So it takes days to weeks, depending on the tunnel, uh, the, the tunnel conditions, the geological conditions, the lining conditions, many factors. So normally it's a, a massive task and also if, if it is a power tunnel then uh, you will lose the revenues during that outage period so generally devoting for an inspection is a critical task and if we have any other technology to inspect a tunnel without the devoting it will be very uh, useful for the industry <clears throat> now these ROVs have been used in many other applications now it has come to be inspection of tunnels. Now in this evening, today we are going to discuss about the application of ROVs with uh, two experts in the subject and I hope you you all will find it interesting. So let me, without taking further time, you know, Andres to start the presentation. And as usual, I think uh, you all will have interesting uh, questions on this subject and we have enough time. So we'll take up all the questions kindly uh, Post your all your questions in the our chat box, and then we will take it up at the end of the presentation. And also, it's possible if we have enough time, we can go for open discussion there. You can uh, use your raise hand facility and uh, discuss the questions also. So now let me invite uh, Dr. Andres to uh, tell us about the how we have to with tunnel inspection. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Kamal, for a very nice and kind introduction. And I uh, would like to start for thanking you for inviting us and uh, happy to establish a contact and relationship with you. And uh, we are really proud and happy to join you or uh, your, your committee's meeting and introduce and present uh, a little bit on what we are doing and, uh, and interested in and been working on for at least last 20 years and, and happy to share our knowledge and our understanding of the problems and uh, maybe present and give some ideas on the ways to, to how to deal with them and, and, and what kind of technical equipment and, uh, 
and solutions are available for, for solving those issues. So thank you very much for that kind of introduction. And um, I will start then uh, with a presentation as that, uh, and uh, as Kamal said, please uh, either collect your questions in the end and we're happy to answer and discuss particular subjects or features or, uh, or questions related to these issues. Um, if it's something completely unclear, so don't feel feel free to also to break and, and point the question if you if you want to have a little bit more explanation of what I try to explain and and, and, and show. So uh, let's start then. Uh, I hope everybody is seeing my screen. And um, uh, as I mentioned already, the presentation is basically focusing on the inspection and the maintenance of flooded tunnels and uh, how we do that uh, with the equipment. Uh, uh, we use the uh, ROV submarine vehicles uh, equipped with the 3D sonar. And um, I'm myself presenting and also my colleague Miko uh, presented as well present. And uh, we both will try to answer and explain uh, how these operations works and answer any specific questions you, you would have. Uh, a little short presentation of, uh, of our as uh, people behind the LOXUS, uh, which we're both uh, uh, presenting. Uh, as uh, Kamal already introduced, I myself, uh, as a, I'm a geologist as a background and uh, been doing um, geological uh, research work in the beginning. And then since almost 15, 16 years ago, uh, turned into more rock engineering and uh, applied science. And we're working since then with, uh, uh, with the rock engineering task for the, for the tunneling projects. Uh, mainly in Sweden, where I'm, where, I'm, where I'm situated, but also in other Scandinavian countries. Uh, Mikko, Mikko Simola, he's, uh, as we said, uh, uh, from Finland, and uh, for the last over 25 years already, uh, been working and was active uh, as a marine rescue officer in the Swedish, Finnish Coastal Guard, and for more than 20 years ago, started the company Loxus and started with the developing the tools and equipment for the ROV operations and specifically for the inspections of the flooded tunnels. And um, as I said, it's not only tunnels, uh, it's a major task for the operations. You're also sometimes uh, investigating the seafloor uh, for wrecks, for toxins, explosive, uh, airplanes, whatever can, is whatever is missing. And uh, I guess the, the front line of that case is that uh, Mika was the one started developing the equipment and, and, and techniques for inspection of uh, tunnels uh, and specifically long tunnels uh, uh, using the ROV technology. Uh, I will take opportunity just to give a short background of uh, our company before we go to the subject. Uh, so the LOXUS Technologies uh, as a company started uh, back in 1998, was established in Finland and uh, since 200, uh, 2018 operating on the, the name LOXUS 3D Tunnel Inspections. Uh, uh, this last, uh, the second part, partner of that group is Loxus Consulting, uh, which is a Swedish registered company and uh, started its uh, operations since last year in Sweden. And uh, we preserve or, or deliver the number of services uh, basically within the professional diving and uh, of course, which is subjects of today, ROV operations uh, in flooded tunnels, as well as uh, tunnel engineering services. Uh, as we know, not we are situated in Scandinavia, but uh, we operate worldwide. And uh, our clients uh, normally, usually, includes um, hydropower stations or power plants, uh, fresh and wastewater companies, and other larger industries which requires large quantities of water, which is quite commonly, at least in Scandinavia, are used to transport it, its water through the through the tunnel system or network. Uh, so what we offer uh, as our services, basically what we do and what we're targeting, it's basically give the risk assessment of the flooded tunnel infrastructure. We use a number of tools, number of approaches to achieve that, but that's basically the major task and major help for the client to do the risk assessment or the, or the, or the status of the infrastructure. And we do it by the using number of, of tasks, number of steps on the way. Uh, we 
can help and produce an inspection and maintenance plans, both for flooded but also for ordinary tunnels. And that, that will be the case, the dry tunnels. Uh, we execute the ROV inspections basically of any dimension of tunnel and with our equipment uh, up to seven kilometers from the single access point. Uh, during those inspections, we generate the uh, 3D multi-beam sonar data, uh, which we'll look at a little bit later. Uh, we can generate a video or photogrammetry data or laser data, which uh, can be adjusted or used for different purposes, depending on the tasks or the, or the assignment. Uh, for our inspection periods or our inspection campaigns, uh, so we have our own uh, tunnel engineer on site uh, who can do the uh, direct assessment of the data, can help guide the operators to navigate in the tunnels and look at the specific areas of the tunnel of interest, and also uh, kind of be present uh, during the preparational work and during execution. Uh, after inspections, we deliver or prepare the technical reports uh, for the inspection itself, uh, but also uh, includes also geological or rock engineering evaluation of the data and help in the way for the, for the client to understand the, the, the results of the data in, in the way which we gather from the different point of, point of view. In case there is a troubles or, or problematics in the tunnel which have to be solved, we also uh, can help design the technical solution for the rehabilitation works and also uh, in some cases help with the project or technical management of the rehabilitation works. So that's basically a package of our services. Uh, so leaving the little bit general introduction, uh, we'll go uh, jump to the, to the points of, the, of today's seminar. Uh, as it mentioned, I tried to address and explain and visualize some of the points basically related to the ROV equipment or vehicle itself. For those maybe who haven't been in touch with that technology before, so can try to most to visualize, explain how it works. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the sonar technology, uh, the main tool basically which we use in the inspection and uh, inspection of the flooded tunnels and how and what kind of data we can generate and what you can expect from that data. Uh, for those who has maybe interest in the in the structural stability of the tunnels or tunnel engineering, uh, we'll touch a little bit on the on the processes and um, uh, degradation, uh, so to say, of the structural integrity of the tunnels. Uh, what kind of features we're looking at and what kind of features you can expect from the inspection data. Uh, also, we'll touch a little bit about the technical assessment of the inspection data, uh, what, 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 what you could expect and how to interpret that. And um, also a little bit about other possible applications of ROV, not only for inspection, but also for the maintenance uh, or some sort of maintenance of the tunnels, which are possible to do with the, with the equipment, which we, which we use and, and, and normally, uh, normally operate with. Uh, a little bit introduction on, on the flooded tunnels. Uh, so rock tunnels or sometimes combined rock concrete tunnels are quite normally usually used for the extensive conveying, so to say, of water in the industry or energy or municipal applications. And the um, normal typical example of those could be that, uh, of course, uh, hydropower plants most of them uh, has some sort of network of uh, tunnels for for water transport from the dam side to the to the uh, to the uh, to the turbines part of the, of the, of the power plant. Uh, nuclear power plants uh, also requires large quantities of water for cooling purposes of the reactors, and uh, for majority of the power plants, nuclear power plants in in Scandinavia is also that kind of water transport is handled through the rock tunnels. Uh, majority or mainly uh, for the water transport for the, as a drinking water or sewage water, like a municipal activity. Uh, also in many cases uh, is handled through the tunnel networks. 
and uh, those uh, world longest tunnels uh, existing is basically for that purpose transporting the, the 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 water drinking water from the reservoirs to the to the populated area areas and also the raw water supply for the larger industries uh, uh, water intense industries like uh, pulp and paper industry chemical industry all those uh, uh, factories or larger uh, larger factories requires uh, large amounts of water and uh, some of them maybe are situated close to the to the seashore where where they're impossible to get uh, large amounts of the of the fresh water and that one has to be transported from from inland and in that case uh, usually that transport is uh, support for the tunnel is is, is is executed through the through the tunnels um, and as was mentioned previously of course as well uh, Tunnels, uh, specifically those uh, tunnels we're talking about today, problematic with them that they are constantly flooded. Uh, and despite the fact that they're constantly flooded, they're still tunnels and they still need uh, monitoring and maintenance inspections at regular basis to be able to guarantee the lifetime of the tunnel, but also to be able to identify and, uh, and, and, and observe the potential failures, potential risk areas, and uh, be a little bit ahead of the geological processes to be able to maintain the tunnel in the, in the lifetime as it was designed or planned from the beginning. And uh, unfortunately, uh, during the for the operation itself of, for the maintenance inspections uh, that that the cost and the operational reasons uh, those tunnels preferably should be inspected in the way that affects operation itself as little as possible uh, and we'll look a further more about that uh, specific cases uh, and comparisons between the um, uh, inspections and the flooded state compared to the compared to the uh, dry or physical inspections. Uh, from our experience and uh, discussing and talking to the, to the clients or tunnel owners, basically all over the world, this does not not only problem for for Scandinavia or Europe or South America or so Asia. It's basically all the clients are handling the same problems and we're noticing and, and observing that many of the flooded tunnels uh, either never been inspected since they be constructed or they do really lack the regular maintenance inspection and there's a number of factors which are affecting that and results into that. Uh, one of the things which, which can be the reason for that is that uh, uh, we have a or there is a lack of the closing gates or they are difficult to control or difficult to operate. So it's hard to empty the, or dewater the tunnel. Um, the dewatering of the tunnels is usually quite a long procedure and it requires uh, extensive time periods for first dewater, some to inspect and then to rewater the tunnel again. And that's of course a extremely complicated and costly operation itself plus that it requires also that you have to shut down the operation whatever requires that water which flows to the to the to the to the facility so if it's a hydropower plant you maybe have to close or shut down the operations for a period of a couple of weeks or maybe months to, to to do that and that's of course always a value of the evaluating costs uh, versus uh, profits and and, 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 uh, and and risk assessment. And uh, unfortunately, in many cases, uh, the cost and, and profit is uh, quite important each feature for the client and, and, and those maintenance plans uh, don't get as much attention as it, as it should. Uh, in some cases, some of the tunnels are basically constructed in the way that they are almost impossible to empty. Uh, and that's usually due to some type, some sort of uh, tunnel, tunnel geometry. If we have a, a low point in the middle of the tunnel, then basically that part of the tunnel can't be uh, emptied of the water in natural way. So you have to require pumping facilities and pumping, uh, pumping works, which is even more, creates more complexity, uh, time consumption and, and, and costs for, for, for do that kind of emptying, uh, empty, em emptying procedure. 
and uh, even despite the facts of the cost and time which takes to, to, to inspect physical tunnels or physically spanked tunnels in the dry conditions, it's still with all the precautions and, 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 and safety planning, it is a dangerous operation, especially, especially dangerous operation for the people who have to enter the tunnel. Uh, and you're entering the tunnel of unknown conditions and uh, unknown situation. Uh, the tunnels by its nature, uh, for the tunnels, they don't have a ventilation. So it's always a risk of, of, of entering such, such other facility. Uh, tunnels itself can be steep declining, uh, hard, hard to, hard to walk or hard to, hard, hard to, hard to enter. It could be muddy or rocky or blocky in the bottom, which also complicates your way of, of moving around in, in, the, in the facility. Uh, in the worst case, this also can be partially dumped. If you even think that you emptied the tunnel from the water and it's dry at the end, and if you're entering from the low part of the tunnel, uh, it is a risk that some part of the tunnel can be partially dumped. And this uh, partial dumps in the tunnel can fail at any time while you try to inspect it. And that's definitely a quite a large, a great risk for the personnel entering and walking inside the, inside this facility. And um, even for the planning purposes, just uh, like a lack of the proper communication network in the tunnel, it's also safety issue and uh, safe communication for this kind of operations is crucial. And it also can be, uh, can be additional complication for planning for um, for walk safe planning uh, procedures for these kind of uh, walks inside the empty tunnel. Therefore, an, uh, an ROV, uh, which we talk about, basically can operate in the tunnel without the watering. So you skipping or don't have to, to, to proceed with this complicated and costly procedures of the dewatering of the tunnel. And also, uh, by using the remotely operated vehicles, you can execute the execute inspection under the safe walking condition. And uh, I guess also last, or maybe not the least uh, important uh, feature is that also it can, compared to the dewatering procedures, being executed extremely fast and affects the operations of the of the facility for extremely short time compared to what it takes for the for the dewatering procedure. Uh, just an example, maybe in normal conditions with the easy access and and uh, and non complicated uh, uh, inspection uh, uh, procedures, we normally do the inspection of five or seven kilometers of tunnel in the matters of. 10, 12, 15 hours. So basically within one day, we can do the inspection and the only time while we affect the operations in that facility is the 10 or 15 hours. And then we take out the equipment back and, uh, and the tunnel and the facility can go back to the normal operation status uh, and uh, without larger preparations or without larger effect on the restart of the operations as well. Uh, if we look at the typical problems or typical uh, uh, failures which happening in the in the flooded tunnels, uh, and uh, of course it's result in the end in the stop in the water flow or or major blockages of the waterway, which of course affects the capacity and the water flow required in the tunnels to be to be used. And normally what we detect and find is uh, you normally have a rock fallout. Uh, single or number of blocks, uh, maybe in larger tunnels, so uh, one single block doesn't make big difference, but also it can be actually indication and uh, signature that something is geologically happening in the tunnel. And that could be an indication that the partial or even the total collapse of the tunnel is ongoing. So that kind of features we try to observe and, and follow up to be able to have this uh, long time uh, uh, long time observation pr procedure that 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 helps to, to, to estimate the status of the tunnel by during the data inspection but also the progress of the other damages uh, farther further in the future of course the partial and total collapse um, it's nothing uh, 
nothing is uh, uh, none of the clients of course uh, willing to discover that one but uh, unfortunately they happens and uh, normally those uh, kind of larger collapses uh, if not monitored not inspected uh, uh, appears and in the way that the flow of the water in your tunnel decreases rapidly or even stops totally. And uh, you unfortunately may be at that stage already too late for doing that kind of precaution or, or, or inspection works at the time and then trying to find what really happened. Uh, besides the fallouts and the collapse of the tunnels, uh, in some cases, even the sediment collection can be a quite large uh, problem in the tunnels. Uh, most commonly, uh, it happens in the tunnels with a little bit lower flow, uh, low turbulency, uh, where we either do the water flow or maybe more complicated geometry of the tunnel can have a, a collection of the sediments which can accumulate and in the end basically block all the all entire area of the tunnel and, 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 and causing the stop of the water flow. Uh, in addition to the effect of the tunnel itself and water flow in the tunnels, uh, the tunnel instability uh, and maybe collapse in a larger scale can also be the reason and affect the soil stability on the top of the tunnel, above on the ground. And uh, that can cause in the worst case, even the causing the, uh, the gullies on the surface of the tunnel, uh, on the surface of the ground, uh, just above the tunnel. And uh, of course, then it's not the issue of the facility itself that it don't have enough water for, to operate, but also that creates a risk and potential damage for the third party properties, for infrastructure on the surface and even lives if, 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 if when, when you're really unlucky if you are in the populated areas. So those things uh, has to be taken care of and taken care of seriously because it's uh, damages is, can, be, can be fatal. Uh, typical reasons for the failure, um, it's always specific cases, specific tunnels, but, but uh, if to summarize our package maybe in, in some typical features is that normally it's poor rock conditions from the beginning, which affects the total tunnel stability and uh, with the water flow or insufficient maintenance, uh, those conditions worsen and uh, can in the end result uh, fall off or break offs or partial or total collapse of the tunnel. If the poor rock quality or even the good rock quality in combination with the uh, swelling clay, so material which uh, which kind of can be affected by the, by the contact with the water, that's also can make a large damage even for the quite good quality rocks on the tunnels and, and, and can be a major factor for the stability of the tunnel. Uh, the second thing is of course the uh, reinforcement of the tunnels um, and the insufficient amount or insufficient design of the reinforcement also can be the reason for the for, 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 for tunnel uh, for, for damages in the tunnel. And uh, insufficient reinforcement uh, can be of course reason for uh, poorly executed design or maybe not uh, correctly not correctly uh, uh, estimated geological conditions rock conditions and so on so all these features are hard uh, are possible uh, possible uh, influences to the to the way uh, how the tunnel aging and how the reinforcement elements uh, operates and, and and helps for tunnel stability during the time and then, of course, for different regions uh, where we have a seismic activity or, or, or reasons for that, of course, that also affects uh, even quite good condition tunnels. And, and uh, it's not only affect the constructions or housing or, 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 or structures on the surface on the ground, but also the tunnels. So in the areas with the high seismic activity, of course, that has to be taken into consideration both during design, but also during the maintenance and lifetime of the tunnel. Uh, so that's a little bit of the general introduction and then uh, uh, we'll try to jump a little bit to the next point uh, uh, related to the equipment itself and uh, talk about a little bit about the uh, uh, ROVs or remotely, remotely operated vehicles. Uh, there's some, some of the pictures or images of, uh, of our equipment and uh, ROV is, um, stands for remotely operated vehicle and that's basically what it does. We have a 
in that case, and a submarine uh, uh, vehicle, which uh, is connected with the operator or with the surface with a, with a cable. And the uh, uh, cable is uh, used for the power supply to the ROV, which uh, operates on the electrical motors. But also uh, cable includes an uh, optical cable, which transfer the data and all the information back to the operator uh, who is sitting on the surface and then can navigate, observe, and quantify the data, which is uh, transformed. Uh, when it comes to the to the tunnel inspections, um, it's always a kind of issue of the balance, balance of finding the big enough ROV and long enough cable to be able to reach the point in the tunnel which you're interested. Uh, if the tunnel is large and tunnel is long, then you can imply or can use a larger ROV with a, with a more uh, thrust power to be able to to pull the long cable or the, in, in its entire length through the tunnel. Uh, but if the uh, tunnel is smaller or maybe uh, entrance or entrance point is too small and you can't get with a large ROV, you have to use something smaller. And those, of course, has a less power and, and can reach to the shorter distances. So in our setup, uh, basically we use normally for the tunnels, which is uh, enough size for enter, enough, enough size to navigate. We use our larger explorer type of ROV, uh, which is then becoming connected with, the, uh, uh, in our case, with a seven kilometer cable. And uh, it's powerful enough to, to pull the cable off the full length. Uh, in the shorter, smaller tunnels or the specific tasks, we're using the small ROVs. And uh, this one is at least uh, one third of the size. And, uh, but of course the capacity and the uh, thrust power is smaller. So that one is maybe suitable for the tunnels up to two, three kilometers only. Uh, uh, and then it's not, uh, not, not capable to pull the longer cable anymore. So operation itself is that um, ROVs are equipped with a, a number of uh, sonars, number of cameras, its own lights, the propellers, which operates and drive the ROV forward. And uh, all the data from the cameras, from the sonars are transported or transferred through the cable back to the operator who is sitting at some sort of field office outside and receive that all data and use that data to navigate, to observe and do the kind of first estimate of the conditions uh, on site and, 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 and proceed with the inspection. And uh, in, that, in that case, uh, um, this uh, combination of the equipment, ROV and cable together with the operator, that's basically the, the, the core of the operations which is needed for, for executing the, this type of inspections. Uh, then it concerns so it comes to the data collection. Uh, I mentioned already about the cameras and 2D sonars which we use, uh, but for the tunnel inspections since 2016, uh, we start using a, a multi-beam sonar, which was developed by Teledyne Marine back in 2016. And uh, we at Loxus are proud that we were the first operator, ROV operator in the world who equipped our ROV with this, uh, uh, with this multi-beam sonar. And that one is basically designed for doing the inspections of the closed spaces like tunnels. And it um, generates a 360 view of the scanning area and creates a continuous 360 profile through the tunnel or, 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 or the close space you, you, you're traveling from. It's a quite a compact system. Uh, it's mounted usually in front of the ROV itself and uh, it collects the data and transfers back to the operator. So you can navigate, observe and, and, and already online do the first estimate of the, of the generated data. Uh, the uh, sonar itself, um, is uh, suitable basically for the tunnels in the size range two to 60 meters diameter. Uh, it can be also be used for larger tunnels, but then probably we'll need to do the scanning on each side of the wall or number of scans to be able to combine this more detailed 3D scan data and, and, and to generate the, the more uh, uh, complete data of the tunnel. But uh, uh, basically, as I mentioned, since 2016, that was a major tool and, uh, and widely used for the tunnel inspections. Tunnel inspection works and generates at most 
profound and, and uh, suitable data for these applications. Uh, if you go a little bit about the inspection method and <clears throat> just explain how the process and logistics around it works basically. Uh, normally uh, equipment I showed, uh, uh, the cable and the uh, ROV itself is transported to the site. Uh, the cable uh, uh, cable counter or the cable row itself stays on the surface. The control center where operator sits is also stays on the surface. So it's only ROV connected with the cable which uh, enters the tunnel and navigates inside the tunnel. Uh, so this ROV equipment we use uh, our Explorer model. It weights almost five, 600 kilos. So you kind of require some sort of lift uh, support, either mobile crane or some other kind of uh, winch system to be able to, to lift the ROV down to the surface of the water. And then it can be disconnected from the, from the crane or lifting uh, uh, unit, and basically just connected with the cable, navigates and, and transports its way, finds its way through the tunnel of interest or inspect the full length of the tunnel till you come to the other end. Uh, the first thing which we usually ask our client and we're starting discussing about possible inspections of the tunnel is uh, basically the how does the access point to the tunnel looks like and uh, almost every tunnel have uh, more specific issues concerning to the access points. And uh, that's an important part in the logistic planning and the preparational work, preparational work uh, to be able to efficiently and safely uh, get into the tunnel want to inspect and maybe do the preparational work to be able to get to that, uh, to that place where we can uh, put the ROV in the water disconnect and let it go on our own machine. And uh, in some cases, it's uh, maybe you have some access shaft or some easy accessible point where you just can lift down the ROV with the help of crane down to the water surface, disconnect, and you're ready to go. Um, in any case, other cases, maybe access is through some open basin or uh, close to the dam and reservoir, which is also pretty simple case to, to, to access. So you can uh, lift down the ROV to the water level. You can even assist with the with the diver if you if you need if you have some troubles, and 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 easy to operate and easy navigate from there. Um, all type of uh, ear vents, uh, swelling uh, towers, and so on. Those are usually quite a good points to access. They usually have an opening on the top and have a free access to the water surface. And then using this vertical shaft, you always get down to the level of the tunnel where you can navigate in either direction and access the point of the tunnels. Uh, but of course, uh, not all the facilities are built and with the idea that they will be inspected or especially if they will be inspected with the ROVs or that kind of facility uh, or sort of that kind of units. So sometimes you have to find a little bit uh, uh, unorthodox solutions. And uh, sometimes these access points are situated inside the buildings or housing. So you help, hopefully you have a door or some kind of access point. Uh, there was a cases where we basically have to make the hole in the wall to able to, 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 to access the point we want. Um, in another case, is maybe access is not just straight to the water. There is maybe some kind of uh, structure, the, uh, the vent or, or, or the inspection hatch or something has to be dismantled to be able to, to get down to the, to the water surface with the, with, the, with the ROV. In other cases, uh, those uh, opening hatches are quite small and we basically have to have a centimeter or <laughs> close to millimeter precision to, for the planning to understand exactly do we fit or we don't fit into that opening. And if it's uh, too small and maybe we have to do some preparation works to be able to, to make this opening large or find some other way to get to the surface of the water. And then of course, um, in many cases, there is a remains uh, access or work tunnel left from the construction site period, uh, which is not used anymore, but still gives you access to the to the to the water surface. So, with the suitable equipment, you basically can drive your ROV down to the surface and 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 let it um, uh, let it down at the water surface, and then it can operate from there down to the main tunnel and inspect in both both directions, so that to the direction of interest. Uh, so once we got the ROV in the water, uh, we disconnected, we started inspection. 
all the our personnel operators and, and, and geologists or engineers sitting in the control center center on the surface and basically doing this first assessment and navigate through the tunnel and uh, and try to record as much possible data as possible observations and and and, and use the data for the navigation and, and interpretation uh, there's two sets of data maybe which is usually we collect during the inspection itself so as i mentioned as showed previously we have this uh, number of cameras with the lights oriented forward to the sides to the roof to the bottom of the tunnel uh, so we can basically have this visual inspection and uh, look at the failures the structures the potential blocks or, or changes in geometry just with the help of the video cameras but uh, the problem usually is that uh, it's totally dependent on the water quality if we have a uh, murky water so we have a lot of particles organic particles sediment in the water it can be the case that basically you see nothing from the cameras and you are totally blind then concerning the camera so you kind of see this uh, gray nothing uh, non-informative image which basically doesn't help you a lot but in the cases where the water is clean is quite a very good device a very good useful data to collect and helps you to navigate helps you to avoid the collision with the uh, obstacles and so on and also gather you quite a lot of information important for, for, for doing the estimate uh, besides the cameras, uh, we're using also the 2D sonars for no, normally for navigation purposes. Uh, advantage with the sonars, uh, they, are, they are basically light or visually uh, visual uh, quality independent. They can operate a total darkness and even to the muddy, muddy waters, and it's not affected by that. So you kind of can operate in total darkness. And that's basically best advantage of the sonar equipment in flooded tunnels that you are not dependent on the light, not dependent on the water quality. So either you collect the 2D data for navigation, or in this case, generate with the 3D multibeam sonar uh, point cloud data, which then you can uh, use during the inspection itself to monitor inspection, do the first observation, but also in afterhand use that point cloud data to generate the tunnel model, export it to the any AutoCAD software, whatever you're using, and do the detailed analysis. Go meter by meter for inspection, do the sections, do the profiles, whatever you're interested in the, like any construction or scanning data you receive from the any other kind of underground facility. So it's a useful tool during inspection, but also most part of the big part of the analysis can be and have to be done after the inspection uh, back in the office. Uh, if we talk a little bit about the degradation or the, or the, or the structural stability integrity of the flooded tunnels. Uh, tunnels as such flooded or dry basically have a quite a lot of similarities concerning its stability, quite a lot of similarities how they are built and, and how, they, how they're aging. And uh, the structural integrity of the tunnel itself normally relies on the rock mass itself, of its quality, uh, in combination with the reinforcement which, uh, uh, which we install during the construction of the tunnel. And uh, reinforcement normally is some sort of uh, rock bolts, uh, shotcrete, uh, cast concrete structures, maybe steel constructions in some cases, but uh, those are basically quite similar features both in the water tunnels or flooded tunnels and, and, and any other uh, infrastructure tunnel in that way. So the degradation processes of the tunnel also is quite a similar for many cases for the flooded and dry tunnels. Uh, you of course have a degradation of the rock mass itself after you blast it, after you affected it with the, with the, with the, with the blasting uh, works or, or even uh, uh, drilling works uh, uh, after the, if you, if you have a TBM tunnel case, uh, the degradation of the rock mass uh, is time dependent and condition dependent and uh, poor rock quality has a definitely effect which speeds up that, those processes. If you have a swelling place, uh, that's of course also creates very unpredictable conditions in behavior of the of the, of the rock tunnel. Uh, you of course could have caused some of the damages by blasting or the blasting damages to the rock walls uh, through 
not too careful blasting or too extensive blasting. And then, of course, the uh, rock stresses, uh, initial rock stresses and rock affects the stability of the tunnel and, uh, and affect the, the long time stability of, of, of the rock mass itself. Uh, the reinforcement features which we installed then during the construction of the tunnel, the bolts itself, rock bolts, they, they can corrode. Uh, you can have a leaching of the cement mortals in the, in the, in the, in the, in the holes. You can have a chemical degradation of the cement. And of course, all this corrosion or leaching of the cement model features affects the, uh, affects the, uh, the purpose of the, of the rock bolts and the, and, and, and the, the ability to, to, to carry the, the loads of the, of the, of the rock mass uh, around the tunnel. The same is for the shotcrete or, or cast concrete structures, which can maybe is installed. Uh, they also are affected by the, by the water and by the time. Uh, and can result in the carbonatization and leaching and erosion uh, or even corrosion of the fibers or the mesh, depending on what kind of a reinforcement uh, design it was applied for these part of tunnels. So those are quite common and, and, and something to be taken care of and, uh, and observed during inspections. Uh, <clears throat> what is a little bit specific for the uh, for the flooded tunnels, that of course we have a, we have a water uh, fl flooding through the tunnels and in many cases, this water flow are not stable uh, and we have a quite a large variations in hydrostatic pressure. Specifically in the hydropower plants, uh, you have a, a not constant water pressure, you have a pressure strokes, you have a swelling and even the negative pressures during the load changes or maybe shutdowns of the operations. And all those variations in the hydrostatic pressure to affect also the rock stability or stability of the walls of the tunnel. And uh, what we mentioned previously about the physical inspections and the, the watering of the tunnels for purpose of the inspection of the tunnel, that in the way also basically negatively affects the total stability of the tunnel. So if you really don't have to do that and if you don't need to go in, tun in tunnel physically, it's better to, to let it be and don't empty the tunnel from the water because basically you also in that operation, you're causing some sort of effect, a negative effect on the total stability. Um, if we look at the technical assessment of the data and um, how we prepare and how we uh, use our data and what we can expect uh, and how we interpret our data. Uh, in all the cases, when you whatever kind of tunnel inspection you do, you do, you, it's always a important part of having a knowing the tunnel or knowing the geology around the tunnel before you're going there and before you do the inspection. So a preparation work, an analysis of the uh, any geological data available or documentation from the construction period or construction documentation, as build documentation, or, and hopefully maybe even some documentation from previous inspections. It's important documentation to, to be familiar with and to be uh, understand that before you do the inspection. And that gives you better understanding of what kind of uh, features you can expect and how to interpret the features you see. Uh, during inspection, uh, we collect uh, video data or laser scanning data, or maybe from video data, we create uh, photogrammetry models. All those data, which as I mentioned previously, depended on the water quality, and in some cases, very good tool, but in some cases, completely useless if you don't see anything. Uh, and these ones can be used for kind of doing a normal geological mapping, uh, geological conditions assessment. You can identify lithology, uh, blockage, failures, fractures, patterns, and so on. So you can do the rough geological mapping from the data, just based on the visual data. You can also visually inspect the reinforcement in the tunnel. Uh, you can look at the visual, visual parts of the visible parts of the bolts. You can look at the surfaces of the shortcrete and, uh, and, and concrete or steel structures and kind of try to identify the potential damage or potential, uh, uh, potential ongoing damage in these features and evaluate that as well from the video data. Uh, but in case visual data is not available uh, or on bad quality, then basically the only tool which you can rely on is the sonar data and preferably 3D sonar data, which gives you full coverage of the tunnel length, its geometry, um, 
structural elements, uh, reinforcement, uh, blockage, so you can both identify and quantify the, 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 the size and type of failure or tunnel collapse or sediment collection, whatever kind of problems you may, may encounter. Uh, just to illustrate uh, how, what is possible to achieve and uh, what kind of uh, uh, data we can use and, and, and can identify and, 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 and visualize. Uh, there's some examples from the video data from relatively clean water, I would say, uh, results where you actually can use a visual data and do record and identify specific uh, features which may be useful. Uh, like example, here, for example, a picture of the uh, unsupported rock wall. So you basically can see the lithology, you can see the fracture patterns, uh, you can identify the quartz veins or pegmatitic veins penetrating the uh, some sort of darker gnasic material. Uh, then you look at the concrete structures. Uh, there's a picture of the concrete wall with a yeah, with some kind of steel uh, uh, leather or, or traps on the, mon, mon, <clears throat> installed in the wall. So you can also identify the, or kind of evaluate the surface conditions of that, or, or, or that concrete wall, eventual discoloring or maybe physical damages to that, uh, minor fractures, building and so on. So quite a reasonable data to, to be able to evaluate the quality of the, of the, of the concrete structure. Uh, in this case, a picture of the tunnel wall with a shotcrete, a reinforcement for the shotcrete. It's also in the way you can give a judgment on the quality of the shotcrete. Uh, you can identify the small fractures happening there. Uh, so normally you can you can, be, can identify the eventual fall-offs or, or, or ongoing damage pro pro procedures in the, in the shotcrete. So possible to get kind of have a kind of assessment which you maybe can otherwise assume or it can be can be seen during normal physical inspection uh, the same for the steel structures um, uh, there's some part of the steel structure uh, filmed and you basically can 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 see the shape and size of it at, at least and of course with the level of the corrosion or level of the physical damage or whatever the features that can be can be affecting that uh, the same value is for the more detailed analysis. If you go into the and have to analyze your data in more specific, like a millimeter, submillimeter precision, <laughs> there's a, a submarine or underwater walking laser scanners which can be used. And even without the scanning, just from the video data or photos, you can create the photogrammetry model which can you basically give you a uh, the, the picture of the structure in millimeter precision and, and, and evaluate the features which might be interested in particular cases. Um, there's some image of the scanning of the steel pipe uh, from inside with the laser scanner and there you can see the damages, damages in the deformation of the, of, the, of the shape of the pipe but also the damages on the surface on millimeter scale. Uh, this image from the photogrammetry model based on the video data from the uh, in some hydropower plant in Sweden and also basically with a good water condition or clear water condition you can have a reasonable good data from the video cameras and create very detailed photogrammetry model where you can give a ref it uh, so you have a incorrect coordinates with a controlled uh, precision and use it not only for inspection purposes but also for uh, maybe as a construction material or, or, or construction background material for doing the planning for, for, for design works for some new structures or new works inside the tunnel. So that's definitely a powerful, powerful tool. Uh, but as I mentioned previously, it's very much dependent on the visual quality of the water. When it comes to the sonar data, uh, so the sonar data, biggest advantage of that is that it's uh, water quality independent, light independent, and basically with this 3D multi-beam sonar, which we use, generates a complete uh, scan uh, file or scan model of the tunnel you're inspecting. So 
uh, after the inspection, you we creating the, uh, the the file with the point cloud data, and then using any kind of uh, ordinary software which handles uh, point cloud data, you can generate a model, and then use it in any application for doing a stepwise inspection. So detail analysis of particular segments or sections, profiles, or whatever uh, whatever the purpose or the, or the use can be of that. So normally we generate the full scan data for the tunnel and then focusing on the particular intervals which is which were observed during inspection or were observed as a kind of damage during the detail analysis after inspection. Uh, and if you go to some kind of examples, um, uh, just collecting some of the images from the uh, from the tunnel scanning. Uh, here is like example, for example, of the rock tunnel, which was uh, uh, rehabilitated, uh, some sort of collapsed segment or, or affected segment of the tunnel was uh, reinforced with a lining, uh, probably some concrete lining. So you can also basically do the inspection of the rock tunnel itself, but also quality of the, of the, of the executed works and, and, and aging of this concrete structure. Uh, if you look, it was example of the TBM tunnel inspected. And basically, it was or the the task was to investigate the tunnel stability itself, but also observe and quantify the sediment collection in the bottom. And uh, there you see quite clearly case uh, geometry of the uh, kind of circular tunnel is partly occupied occupied by the soft sediment collecting there. And in this case, maybe it's not a big issue, but uh, if you have a kind of blockage or geometry changes of the tunnel, it can be the issue that uh, these collections can reach a reasonable amount. Uh, and of course, the uh, uh, image of the partially or nest almost totally collapsed tunnel in front of us. Um, well, none of our clients are happy then we deliver that image, of course. Uh, but uh, in the way also, the way to, to indicate the problem, locate the problem and identify the problem uh, before you kind of make up your mind and decision on what kind of action, what kind of work has to be done to rehabilitate the tunnel. So that gives you the information needed for, for these cases. Uh, and of course, with the ROV, we can visualize, measure, quantify the quantify the, 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 the type of collapse, uh, the, the type of material collected and, and, and the amount of material collected there. But uh, in a way, you still, in the end, will have for that kind of purposes, uh, the water the tunnel and send the other guys to do kind of uh, planning work or, or emptying work or reinforcement work to solve these issues. And of course, this ROV data uh, before the physical inspection is a great tool for planning, for uh, risk management, for, for preparational works. And so you before you do water and get to the place of the collapse, already know the uh, extension and, and 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 the size of that and 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 then can it be prepared for kind of measures to tackle that and solve it. But of course, it's not always a, as dramatic effects as as, as in this case. Uh, normally, uh, we get to the stage where we can identify and and quantify quite small project, small objects, uh, small failures. Uh, <clears throat> like in this case, uh, we have some kind of failure in the wall of the tunnel where the block, um, maybe three, four meters in size, collapsed from the side. And uh, important observation, if it's a first observation, of course, then you have to decide and maybe kind of make a look a little bit more detail in the geological data around it and kind of uh, make a judgment whether it's a single block from the wall or is something indication of the, or the ongoing um, uh, larger, uh, larger collapse in the tunnel, or if that will be the, inspection after after a number of years as so a second inspection then you can always compare the results from the first and second inspection and kind of evaluate the progress of the of the damage and if it's a single block single event and it nothing happens since previous inspection then maybe it doesn't affect so much of the flow of the tunnel and doesn't affect the total stability of the tunnel uh, in other cases we quite normally reach the places where we have a maybe more intense collapse like here, we have a number of blocks probably lost uh, or loosened from the roof of the tunnel, some in sizes of four meters, some sizes down to the meter. And then you have this collection of the number of blocks in the single place. That's usually the sign that there's something more geological happening in the tunnel. And uh, that's like that kind of features is definitely indication that either you have to make a more uh, 
more uh, random or more, more more often the inspections and follow up the development of this kind of uh, failure and, and 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 understand how it's happening and also have a kind of uh, control and risk assessment of the or the potential risk for the total stability of the tunnel so we kind of uh, indicating these kind of features uh, but even the small dogs um, like sizes of 10 centimeters in size can be identified and uh, in that case, it's probably some uh, one single loose block from the roof, and it's um, don't make uh, a big fuss about the total stability, but it can be follow up in the next next inspection and see if that's a sign for the for the larger damage or just a single block which lost from the roof and that can be lying there in the bottom without affecting anything else. Uh, those samples I showed previously that basically from the horizontal or sub-horizontal tunnels uh, 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 entering there, uh, the same way is also can be done in the vertical shafts and uh, it can be maybe a, a ventilation shaft or access shaft or maybe transportation shaft for some, some purposes. So that kind of inspection also can be done in vertical shafts and getting basically the same data on the walls of the shaft uh, just oriented vertically uh, down to the surface down to the down to the level of the of the main tunnel uh, so a little bit of the <clears throat> summary and technical assessment of the inspection data based on this number of factors which we can record which we can analyze and and, and judge during and after inspection uh, so like a, like any other uh, remote uh, sensing method ROV inspections to be considered as a remote sensing method. And of course it uh, cannot be compared to the physical inspections. You, you won't get exactly the same data, the same, uh, the same observation as you would be physically and uh, at, 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 uh, at, uh, at close to the wall with a, with a hammer or whatever tool kind of try to try to do the inspection as you normally do in the dry conditions. So there's of course the limitations and uh, small fractures or the uh, fracture properties or even the filling of the, of, the, of the fractures could be quite hard or difficult to, to identify and difficult to, to judge properly. Even the adhesive, uh, non-adhesive parts of the rock or short grit or concrete in the tunnel can't be tested and uh, hard to observe it if it's not intensive other features indirectly which can identify that kind of um, uh, potential failure. Uh, degree of weathering of the rock or concrete, if you don't have a very good visual data, also could be very hard or in bad visual conditions, almost impossible to identify. So something has to be considered. And uh, I would argue that uh, it requires a little bit of the training and specific expertise from the, uh, from the tunnel expert or tunnel, ex tunnel engineer to be able to do the careful analysis, understand the data, understand the limits of the data in the way and uh, combine that with the, all the preparational work you've done previously, uh, the previous inspection or, or SBIL documentation, and kind of use that data to do this overall assessment of the tunnel, tunnel status. So it requires some of training and some of understanding of the data and procedures connected to that, to, to execute and make a right, right decision. Uh, if we touch a little bit on the, uh, on the other applications, um, ROV itself, uh, I mean, that's, that's a vehicle. It's a vehicle which able to, to transport itself in the tunnel to the certain amount of distance. And uh, basically the equipment which we add to the ROV, which gives a value for the inspection, either it's a camera or the scanner or sonar. So that's basically what is important with the, with the data collection. But uh, so basically in that way, ROV can be equipped with any sort of equipment or device or tool, which basically can operate on the electricity and can be operated under water conditions. So it can be robotic manipulating arms uh, adjusted uh, or equipped. It can be a uh, drilling equipment to take the sample from a concrete, to take the sample from the rock, uh, to take the sample from the steel construction. Um, basically any kind of device which runs on electricity and can operate under the water, you can put it on the ROV, transport it to the place of interest and do that analysis, which is that detector or equipment is suitable for. 
the other application which uh, we used and in many cases was suitable and, and, and interesting for the maintenance purposes of the tunnel is that also ROV itself can be connected with the pipes or pipelines uh, to the vacuum pumps or some sort of pumping equipment outside the tunnel. And ROV itself gives you a chance to navigate to the point of interest and with a nozzle and a, a visual possibility to do the targeted and monitored emptying of the, of the tunnel from the soft sediment. So in those cases where the soft sediment is an issue, uh, besides the way of normal doing it, empty the tunnel, go with a tractor or lift it and, and, and collect the sediment and transport it out of the tunnel. So the reasonable amount of volumes can be done with the pumps outside the tunnel. And uh, with the help of the ROV, this operation can be executed to a number of 100 meters away from the entrance to the tunnel, inside the tunnel. And uh, of course, it's a slower procedure, but you don't have to empty the water of the tunnel. And that's uh, as I mentioned previously, is a complicated, expensive procedures and also uh, gives a negative effect to the total stability of the tunnel. Uh, not everything is so simple and easy. Of course, uh, navigation with the ROV in the, at the long distance and in the closed spaces as tunnels are, uh, requires quite a lot of experience and a very experienced operator. So the one that knows equipment and, 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 and can read the data from the sonars or cameras and, 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 and do that navigation at the distance. So it requires requirements and, and experience. But uh, even for the, uh, besides what we can control and train ourselves for, uh, there's the features and challenges with, which it will be hard to overcome. One of them is uh, geometry of the tunnel, uh, basically the length and the, and the curvature of the tunnel itself. As I mentioned, we, we have equipment and ROV capable to inspect the tunnel up to seven kilometers from the entrance point. But basically every curve in the tunnel, either horizontally or vertically, uh, the result of this is that the cable creates, uh, or the, we, we're creating the, the friction between the, the cable which we are pulling and the wall of the tunnel. And more of the curves we're adding, the more friction generates between the cable and the walls. And then of course, uh, limits the extent to how long you uh, have enough power to pull the cable. So if you have a complicated geometry, even if you have a seven kilometers cable, you maybe can't reach the last kilometer of the, of the tunnel because you are uh, lack of power to get there. Uh, besides that, the biggest challenge which we usually very have to be careful about that's kind of um, obstacles in the tunnel and uh, you might be surprised but you can find all kind of obstacles which you never would expect in the tunnel and you would never expect that somebody during construction or rehabilitation works left that in the tunnel and that can be uh, scaffoldings that can be some sort of tools machines uh, that can be uh, cables or walls or, or, or cables hanging on the walls or cables loose in the tunnel, which maybe were used for hanging up the ventilation or some equipment or whatever kind of uh, tools in the tunnel during the, during the construction or rehabilitation works and then just left in the tunnel. And uh, we even find the trucks and cars in the tunnel left probably was the easy way to get. So, so it's a, uh, it can, it can be tricky, it can be funny sometimes, but uh, uh, those kind of obstacles is problematic. And of course, if we, if we get to the place in the tunnel where we have a lot of these obstacles, or they are in, in the middle of the way or complicated to pass like a virus or cables, it could be the reason for us to basically say that we can't go farther and we have to turn around uh, just to avoid the risk that we get stuck in the tunnel and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and can, be, can be able to retreat our ROV back to the uh, entrance point. Uh, the second thing or next thing uh, the, I mentioned about this uh, affecting the affecting the operations uh, and try to affect as little as possible. Of course, we can do the fast and quite a limited period of time we need for inspection. But uh, for that period of time, we basically need almost uh, zero flow in the tunnel or preferably close to zero flow in the tunnel to be able to 
uh, to, to go with it or to have enough power with ROV to, 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 to penetrate the tunnel and, and transport it to the reasonable amount of distance. So the strong water flow or turbulent water, if that's the case, that's an issue we have to be solved. And then of course, it's, uh, it makes heavier or harder to, to navigate and operate, but also of course affects the, uh, the distance of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the inspection interval we can, we can reach. Uh, in some cases for the usually close to the access points, uh, even the vegetation or in cold condition ice could be an issue. Uh, inside the tunnel, uh, something which may affect the data, even from the sonar data, it's uh, air or gas bubbles uh, and uh, specifically air pockets if you have it in the roof of the tunnel. Uh, it's, it doesn't affect the navigation itself, but can affect the quality of the data. And especially if you have uh, ear pockets, the sonars, they works only in the water conditions, so they don't work in the dry conditions. And if you have an uh, ear pocket on the roof, so basically that part of the tunnel roof will be invisible. Uh, in some cases, if it's a major size or larger size of it, you can also probably can you can reach it with a camera. But but if it's smaller air pockets, then it's it's basically a hard hard uh, hard hard way to 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 inspect and visualize these these uh, these parts of the tunnel. So there's some issues. Some of them are um, uh, solvable, and uh, some of them is uh, could be tricky to avoid and and and, and tricky to 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 execute inspection itself. Uh, so to, to summarize and, and, and uh, leave some space and time for discussions and questions. Uh, uh, to summarize, uh, the ROV equipment with the 3D beam, multi-beam sonar, uh, as we showed and explained, currently today is the most advanced instrument to perform the inspection of flooded tunnels and perform those inspections in the work environment safe matter. So that's, uh, I think, important point of the, of the message take, take home. Uh, the combination of the correct size and correct length of the cable uh, will allows us to inspect the tunnels uh, at least seven kilometers from the single entry point. So uh, there are tunnels, uh, I know there are tunnels which are longer and maybe require specific equipment uh, and specific preparations. But basically with the, our pigment, we can pick the tunnel at least 14 kilometers in length if you have access for a bow fence and do the full inspection of that interval of the tunnel. So understanding the, uh, the structure, access points and the, and, and the issues related to that. So uh, inspection is possible to do it quite a long reasonable amount of distances from the access point. Uh, the combination on all the kind of type of data, which I showed previously, combination of the sonar data, video data, uh, the experience of the technician, which evaluates the data present in inspection and quality of the data available before the inspection, all those features or parameters for the person, experienced person can give a specialist and, and, and good enough like, uh, tools to do the overall assessment of the, of the tunnel condition and, and, and uh, to assessment the present condition, but also give the tools to do the risk assessment of the future condition or future development of the, of the, of the potential failures in the tunnel. And uh, <clears throat> the last uh, point to highlight that um, with the ROV uh, type of inspection, we do not requirement, there is no requirement for the, that uh, mentioned costly and time consuming dewatering of the tunnel, which is both costly consuming and also uh, requires and, and makes a, a, a number of additional risks creates for the personnel, but also for the stability of the tunnel itself. So that simplifies the operations itself. And to finalize, uh, if you are interested more and want to check more, uh, can recommend you please visit our, our homepage, uh, loxus.com. Uh, also have present on the LinkedIn, uh, both from Loxus 3D Tunnel Inspections and from Loxus Consulting. So uh, please follow us and, and, and check and we try to post the recent uh, inspection data or new cases on the, on the site. And um, also we'll take opportunity to, to highlight and, and promote a little bit uh, uh, the last number of uh, 
uh, Tunnels and Tunneling International from uh, British Tunneling Society. We just published a new paper uh, in the latest uh, June number, uh, where we basically address and discuss on the uh, 3D tunnel inspections and um, and uh, ROV inspections of the tunnels. So it's a little bit of the or the, or the more data or, or something to read through. So if you have a subscription to the Tunnel and Tunneling International Journal, so you're able to access the, access the article. If you don't have subscription, then I can recommend you please visit my LinkedIn uh, page for Luxus, Luxus Consulting and you can download the full text of the article and, and, and read it through uh, afterwards. So for the moment, thank you from my side. And uh, if there's any questions or, or discussion points which you would like to address, so I'm happy to, to join you all the rest and, and, and uh, leave the word to Kamal if you can guide us through the question procedures. Thank you very much for listening. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Andre, for the very interesting comprehensive presentation. Um, yeah, we, yeah, we can uh, move to the discussion part of the program. But before that, uh, I would like to request you to share some uh, case studies you have. Yep. Yeah. Some week, yeah. That yeah, will be sure. useful to our members, yes. Yeah, sure. Um, before uh, before questions arise, I can also yes. uh, show a little bit of the uh, animation, maybe just to understand a little bit how procedures goes, to visualize okay. uh, how to operate, and then we can show a little bit of the case studies as well. So the uh, short short movie for for your attention. Uh, Inspection itself, basically, what we do, uh, it's uh, operated with the ROV in the water filled condition, conditions. Uh, we use a number of different ROVs uh, for different purposes. And the operation itself is in the way that uh, ROV is lowered to the surface of the water with the help of the crane. It's connected with the cable for the data and power transmission. And the uh, ROV then it's uh, Set down to the surface of the water and disconnected from the from the lifting equipment, and then can travel in the tunnel on its own uh, power uh, to the point of interest. So, as we said, we use the lights and cameras to to navigate and to observe, and uh, also with the sonar data or 3D sonar data, we create this 3D point data of the tunnel itself, which can be observed directly at the at the control center by the operator or technician, but also can be used later on to do the analysis in your choice of software where you can analyze in more details. And then after inspection is finalized, you back to the access point, you lift up your equipment ROV, ROV from the water, uh, and basically inspection itself is finished and the uh, operation in the tunnel can proceed as it was previously. And uh, this kind of inspection, as I mentioned, can take, depending on the length and complexity, maybe 10, 15 hours. And, and, and for, for normal lengths of tunnel up to five, six kilometers, we basically managed to do that within that period of time. So I see some hands have been raised. So Eros, I guess, feel free if Kamal is allowed to, to, to join you. Yes, please. Okay, okay, okay. Now it's okay. Yes. Right, uh, yes, yes uh, thank you very much. It's a very uh, interesting session. And uh, I have uh, uh, two questions. One is, uh, uh, is there any... Uh, uh, Limitation of the ROV. That's mean. Uh, uh, what is the uh, is in a, in one case there is a 1.8 meter uh, gap. Mm -hmm. So 1.8 uh, gap uh, in a search shaft, search chamber. Uh, can mm -hmm. we use this uh, ROV in this gap? Mm -hmm. Understand. 
as I showed um, in some of these illustrations from previously, uh, the size of a ROV, which we're using, it uh, requires approximately one meter wide opening. So it's a one meter wide opening and the length itself, it can be down to 1.23 meters maybe. So that's a little bit of the limit, what size of the hatch has to be to get into the, with the, with the larger ROV. Then of course, if it's hatch is too small, um, it's possible to use a small ROV, but then of course you get to the limitation, how long can you, can you travel in the tunnel? But uh, there's always different ways to approach it. But if you said 1.8 meters in diameter or size, then it's definitely big enough for, for, for the largest ROV which we use. Yeah. Okay. Then, uh, if if there are any uh, guidance, gu guiding guidance uh, of uh, putting down this ROV, or we can uh, just uh, hanging down uh, with the uh, with the use of crane. Normally, Alia, basically, we don't need any guidance uh, or external guidance. Yeah. The thing which is necessary that basically, if you have a hatch like this, open small we have to have a free access, vertical free access to the water surface. So it has to be lifted down to the water surface and then disconnected from the, from the lifting equipment and then it travels on its own. On its own. And there's different types or set, sets or different ways of, of connecting and disconnecting. Either we have a diver which can maybe help to connect, disconnect, or in some cases like uh, I think I had a picture there, with a kind of cage that we can basically don't have to interfere and don't have to have a man uh, power or physical access to the place to disconnect or connect ROV so it can be can be do it completely remotely. So the limitation is a hatch size enough, big enough to opening and free uh, vertical access to the water surface to able to lift down the ROV to the to the water surface and then it's good to go on its own. Okay, thank you. And uh, the very important one is uh, how how about the cost? Uh, how about the cost? Uh, the, this time kind of uh, ROV use in uh, kind of kind, kind, uh, country like Sri Lanka. Mm. I mean, we we traveling all around the world and being in South America and North America and Turkey and Scandinavia and Europe and. Uh, Basically, equipment itself is uh, of that size that it can be put on the how do I say, normal cargo plane. Uh, you can't take it as a hand baggage, but, <laughs> but you can send it with a normal DHL or whatever cargo plane. Uh, and uh, cost for traveling, of course, uh, time and cost for traveling will be more, re more, more suit, more, more larger for the for, to, to travel to Sri Lanka. But, uh, we are now actually planning, preliminary planning one inspection in India and uh, it's not issue to transporting equipment there uh, or exporting our personnel and, and manpower there. Normally for the inspection procedures with the larger ROV, we require maybe five, six persons on site. So it's a quite a big team joining us together to be able to operate. And the uh, equipment itself in total weights maybe about what was it, Miko? About six tons in total with the cable um, and ROVs yes. and all the additional. So it's a large, large package to send and, uh, and the operation itself. And the cost uh, is a expensive and in a way unique equipment, of course. So it's a, it's a reasonable investment for the client and we understand that. But uh, compared to the, the costs of the shutdown procedure, dewatering, uh, time loss, uh, production losses, it's a fraction of cost what what losses would be to the compared to the shutdown of the or the power plant or the or the or the facility. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, uh, in the chat we can find a few questions posted already, and uh, there's a question from, and this you can see it, I, I guess. Uh, uh, let's see. I try to get down. Uh, Pulo Joe. Yes. Yeah, yeah, Pulo Joe. Yeah, I will read it for you. Yeah. Has anyone ever worked on rehabilitation of steel line tunnels in subways? Yeah, uh, continue. Our subway tunnels are yeah. corroding and we cannot replace them as it is cost prohibitive methods such as uh, plate welding or short plate term being considered. Does anyone have any? But I guess that in that Listen. subway tunnels, I mean, they, they are dry conditions. So. 
Uh, yeah. So I guess for normal normal infrastructure tunnels, I mean, you have a kind of uh, easier uh, access and, yeah. and completely different set of tools to be able to assess either concrete or steel structures and rehabilitate them or protect them or so on and so on. So in, in I guess for the if that's a subways and dry conditions, then it's, it's a completely different issue and easier to solve. Uh, if that would be the case with the steel structures in the in the flooded condition, then of course uh, there is a tools to measure the thickness of the goods and and the roughness of the surface and corrosion level. So that one is possible to assess, but uh, of course the rehabilitation works connected to that. It could be a little bit tricky. And probably any works to be done probably has to be done on dry conditions. So you can't apply kind of a, a rust protection or any other uh, tools to, to do that in the in the submerged conditions. Uh, let's see, we have a next yeah. question. Is the yeah. 3D image available online while inspecting or need post-processing? Uh, the images I showed, yes. so, so the point cloud is streamed. So you, you have a, a direct uh, observation while inspecting. Uh, and it's streaming is for the segments you're inspecting and number of meters ahead of the ROV. Uh, those models I showed with analysis of the blocks and uh, uh, like uh, like total uh, total model of the, of the of the tunnel like this, so it requires some uh, post processing of the data afterwards, uh, like cleaning and uh, and adjusting to the to the to the to the depth measurements. So it requires some post processing time, but uh, during inspection itself, you do also have a generated uh, 3D point cloud in front of you so you can navigate and, and do the preliminary observations already on site. And then just a question, I think we discussed, is it possible to use this uh, technology when the water flows under pressure? Um, and there are yes. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's limitations in the in the water flow. Uh, the pressure itself, like the depth of the tunnel, like uh, depending on what kind of conditions. Uh, if you're thinking of static pressure, uh, we can go down to six, seven meters of, of uh, six, six, seven hundred meters of, of, of water depth uh, for the tunnel. So the the static pressure, uh, but the problem is with the, with the flow. So if you have a larger fl the flow in the tunnel, uh, then it's hard to operate and hard to navigate and reach the point. So we normally discussing about the zero flow flow or maybe as maximum one meter per second flow. That's kind of limitation for 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 able to reach uh, the points. <clears throat> There was a question about if you know the type of steel used to construct the tunnels, would you need to test in composition to determine a weldability? Steel that's about 100 years can be varying quality and stands has not adopted industry wide until 60s. The mm effects -hmm. of inclusion in steel may be presented and undermined in the integrated of the, of the weld. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm I myself not a kind of steel specialist, and and, and probably hard to hard to explain exactly uh, on the on the steel quality and welding, or submarine welding conditions. But uh, uh, I guess the the quality and testing of the steel is possible. Uh, underwater welding, I would doubt that possible to do. At least never tried or hear about that. Uh, so I guess uh, this kind of more significant uh, rehabilitation works in the end of the inspection probably has to be done in the dry condition. So after the watering procedure is, is, is executed. Is it able to use the ROV in the free flow tunnel, which has a 1020 of the free space and collect data in the roof? Yeah, sure. I guess 10-20% guess means basically partly, partly flooded. So if you have a, a, the, the air pocket on the one. Yeah, uh, with the free flow tunnels, uh, if we have sufficient depth of the, of the water uh, in the in the water part, so we basically can do this scanning of the bottom of the tunnel with the with the, with the sonar. As I mentioned, sonar doesn't work on the in the in the in the air, so that uh, in that way it has to be a combination of the sonar data in the underwater part, and then the laser or camera or, or some other kind of device which works in the in the dry conditions to do the the upper part of the tunnel. So will be a combination of those two. But uh, if the depth of the water is sufficient, 
for the ROV to transport itself, uh, then it's, it's basically not the issue. It can go, go submerge and do the inspection of the water field and can be uh, as a neutral position on the surface of the water and then we'll be using the camera proceed along the tunnel with the propellers and, and, and basically film or scan the, the roof of the tunnel. So yes, it's possible if it's not too small. Is there a local partner in Sri Lanka or in Asia whom we can contact for ROV inspections in the tun in tunnels? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, the, we have a number of the contacts with the, uh, of, uh, our colleagues in, 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 in business. Uh, this number of uh, European companies uh, in US, in Canada. Uh, we know there's a company, so Australian companies doing kind of similar type of work. Uh, I, at least, we never been in touch or, 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 or came across a Sri Lankan or Indian or uh, companies uh, which do similar kind of work. I know, Miko, if you are with your long experience, uh, came across some kind of local partner, local companies doing the same issues or not? Yes, uh, I have already answered those questions here in the chat, but we don't have in in Sri Lanka. But I have in uh, in the chat, I have been answered those. Okay. Those questions. Yes. I, I do answer here by you talking. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're interested in inspection in Sri Lanka or Asia, you are welcome to contact us as well. <laughs> so we can we can be your local partner in that case. Yes. Uh, question on what's the moving technology of ROV? Uh, Under pressure, I think we discussed that. Yeah. I think, uh, yes, okay. So it's Miko answered already. Let's see which one that was not answered yet. What is a moving technology of ROV? We are using uh, propellers or tracks on the yeah. ROV. Yes, yeah, so as, as Miko mentioned, uh, normally it's a propeller-driven ROV, but in some cases we also can equip it with a, with a, a track-moving propeller, so basically make it drive on the bottom of the tunnel instead of uh, uh, floating on the surface or in, in the water column. And then there's a question from Annie, is it possible to get the inspection data up to certain depth inside the tunnel wall with this method? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, uh, certain depth, uh, as I said, limitation for our equipment is like five, six hundred meters depth. Uh, I guess with some smaller modifications, we could maybe even come down to seven, eight hundred meters. And, uh, and, and I think here his question is not from, uh, as I understand, the certain depth inside the tunnel wall that is the uh, to check the. Okay, so, of the, so the behind, the, behind the wall. Uh, yeah, it's a tricky. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, we basically get the outer current contour of the tunnel with the either visual or ROV or, or sonar data. So they're kind of making a remote uh, uh, penetration radar or whatever kind of type of inspection of the walls is it's tricky. But I guess if there is a device which can be equipped or put on the ROV, you, I can think it's possible to get a geo radar or some other type of equipment. Uh, kind of penetrating radar. Right, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. if yeah. there's yeah. submarine operating helping ground penetrating radar, you could yeah. basically transport it to the place of interest and do that kind of analysis or even maybe some seismic analysis. I don't know uh, if you can can have a connect or detectors placed on the tunnel. So it's a little bit more specific case, but. I guess if but that's a requirement, it's, com it's more complicated, of course, and time consuming, but, but basically, yes, I don't think it's limitation. Uh, it requires more thinking and a little bit adjustment equipment, but, but I would say yes. In this question, what is the speed of ROV? Uh, speed is, yeah, uh, yeah. normal speed, we travel approximately one kilometer an hour speed during inspection. So, uh, to get the reasonable amount of data from the scanning, we kind of go at that, at that pace. So if let's say tunnels five, six kilometers length, so it takes five, six hours to, to, to get to, to the end. And then on the way back, usually, usually then you don't collect the data, you can go faster, but 
but that's approximate time. And also depend on what you eat on the way. <laughs> exactly. So what what you what you're interesting. Yeah, we can go faster, but then you're of course missing all the details, and maybe that's the, the, yeah, the reason yeah. for why you're there. Is it possible to inspect under caustic yeah, Georgia with the water? Hmm? Yes, uh, it's from downstream side with the velo flow velocity. Yeah, and because velocity, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's a limitation. Uh, so we preferably inspect only the still water. And the caustic geology, I guess it can be compared somehow to the to the inspection of the all the mines or, 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 or flooded mines. And that can be done, and we, and we did that, and uh, we can operate basically in a caustic region in the same way as separating the abandoned flooded mines, where you have a more complex geometry. Of course, uh, uh, there's a number of risks connected to that, and of course, as I mentioned, the geometry of the tunnel itself and curvatures limits the distance you can reach, and uh, this friction of the cable to the walls limits the, how far you can get. I guess that was that was a, that, that was a question about. Uh, is it necessary to modify a review for each project based on the tunnel geometry? Normally not. And let's say equipment we use is kind of ultimate size and 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 shape for getting into the rock tunnels, and um, there is hardly a tunnel smaller than four or five square meters, even TBM tunnels maybe, which can get a little bit smaller, but from the production point of view and the purpose of the tunnel, that's usually tunnels uh, of that size and larger. And equipment is basically best suitable for that kind of uh, uh, size of the, of the tunnels. So normally preparational wise, not much preparation for our part. Uh, I guess uh, in the specific cases, especially we discussed in the beginning, uh, this opening or the hatch size, that maybe something has to be uh, addressed and, and adjusted for. So maybe some parts has to be removed or equipment modified somehow that we can get in a very, very tight space uh, and the entrance. But, uh, but normally with the size, with the size of the opening, one times one times meter, basically one square meter and tunnel size from a couple of square meters up to larger tunnels, we can get basically with a normal adjustment as we, as we do with the normal setup. Uh, can same be used for the bottom of a reservoir? Yeah, uh, how the, how oh, sorry. The result, yeah. If we use in a highly polluted stormwater drainage tunnel. Uh, normally, the 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 sonar data basically is not so much affected of the of the polluted or kind of a murky, murky or, or muddish water. You, it's it's a it's a, it's a light and a visually unaffected data which generates. Uh, the only thing which I said can affect the data is like a air bubbles, uh, the gas bubbles or air bubbles, vegetation or such things. If it's not so much of the suspended particles in the water, uh, it, uh, it which which basically can be that uh, the cause that we uh, can't operate basically if it's if it's too dense. But if it's a normal, still uh, water conditions for some kind of particles, it should be able to, 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 to be generated data. So I would say affecting the sonar data, at least affecting uh, marginally. The visual data, yes, then you probably won't see anything. Uh, can the same be used for inspection uh, reservoir bottom? Uh, I guess like at the bottom topography measurements. Uh, for that purposes, uh, the sauna itself is more suitable for the tunnel inspections. For larger uh, bottom surfaces uh, scanning, we use some, some usually use a different type of sauna. And uh, Miko, maybe you can explain a bit of this biometric data type of uh, saunas, which we, uh, we try, try and use the same kind of same tasks. We are using a lower frequency for those reservoir bottoms. It is not done by ROV, we have a um, remote control boat, small boat, one meter to one meter, something like that size. And it has radio control and it depends how big is your reservoir, but uh, it can be done also by multi-beam sonar, like uh, 400 to 700 kilohertz sonar. 
but uh, so that is from the water surface itself. It's not the underwater, is it? Yeah, it is on a, yeah. It's like a boat, small, very small boat, which has a sonar on it. And then somebody asked uh, how if it affect the results if we use it in highly polluted storm water drain that tunnel. If the water is uh, water, is it if it's a water so and there is a lot of uh, small things like from the streets and so on and woods in there so it is very difficult for the thrusters, for the propellers to move in the dirty water. But anyhow, yes, it is possible if there is not, not more than a dirty water, it doesn't matter. So norm, normal, normally, of course, it's preferably that uh, inspection and uh, to, for, for, for operation purposes is better to use a period during the year when maybe you have a little bit of the clearer water during the that part of the year, either summer or winter, depending where you are. But uh, of course, you have a lower flow and lower particle collection. So uh, that's something to also be considered. And of course, having a higher visibility and clearer water helps. And, and, and even the visual tools can be applied and helps to navigate and helps to, to, to penetrate the tunnel. And then and, and generate a new data. Yes. And this is it possible for you to share or one or two? Yeah. From the actual project with data from. Yeah. So please post the questions for the mob so uh, we can come back to them. Uh, let's see. I had it. I have to change the presentation. Yes. Uh, Mr. Kapila, you ask how can you use the ROV to find a water leak inlet at the bottom of a reservoir from reservoir side? Uh, there, there has been a case here in Finland, North Finland, where it was a catastrophe because of the water leak was in the bottom. But we found it the leakage with the side cam sonar. We found the, the small, like uh, two meters to two meters sides uh, uh, hole in the mud in the bottom of the reservoir. And there was a small, like a 10, 15 centimeters hole in the bottom of the reservoir. reservoir. So it is possible and I'm, Quite sure that you have in your in your town nearest town you might have a side scan sonar which you can use there. So it's not a big deal to watch and find the, that kind of holes in the reservoir. Is that enough for Mr. Kapila? So exactly. So it's a kind of there's some standard things which we do and then things which maybe requires a little bit of the preparation and rethinking and different equipment uh, and in this case uh, like a we have like a standard tunnel inspection setup and that's basically what we do often daily with the normal equipment but then every time or now and then there comes a specific issues or specific requirements so different type of material or different type of questions. And those ones is a interesting questions which needs to be developed. And in the way also we will learn ourselves uh, what can be done or what we have to use, maybe modify the equipment, modify the machine to be able to add to tangle that. So there's no impossible answers. Of course, we maybe we haven't tried it yet, but uh, with, a, with, a, uh, with a reasonable task and reasonable explanation of the task, we can adjust and try to solve it. So it's also, even after 20 years, it's a, it's a learning experience. And every tunnel uh, always brings the new challenges and a little bit different challenges. Uh, if it's OK, then I have a little bit short presentation from the case study. Um, yeah, please. Yeah, just, just to illustrate. Yeah. 
uh, and that's a, a case from the inspection from the uh, hydropower plant. Uh, and the task was to inspect the head race tunnel. And uh, in Loxus 3D, we executed that or performed that inspection in the head race tunnel between the dam and the power generation part of the, of the, of the, of the setup uh, done back in 2016. Uh, uh, the power plant itself, uh, it was constructed uh, just a couple of years before inspection, 2011 to 15. So it uh, was the first inspection in that particular power plant. And the uh, setup is consist of the reservoir, water intake uh, structure and the tunnel uh, within approximately 20 kilometers distance from the, uh, from the, from the intake. And the operation or the task was to inspect the first 7.5 kilometers of the tunnel as much as we could reach and uh, uh, inspect it for the uh, eventual collapse or the uh, other possible damages in the tunnel. Uh, and the tunnel itself was a combination of the drill and blast tunnel for the first four kilometers. And then the rest of the uh, will be eight kilometers of the tunnel was a TBM tunnel. So it's above uh, different size from different equipment size, uh, uh, the production uh, production type of tunnels. Uh, equipment we use uh, was on our basically ROV, which I showed us previously, our Luxus Explorer, uh, uh, which was then equipped with uh, uh, observation and uh, for observation and piloting with the five video cameras. Uh, we had a two conventional scanners uh, equipped, uh, one looking forward and then one looking to the side. So gave, make, creating the profile of the, of the tunnel. Uh, we used our 3D sonar, uh, which basically then collect this point cloud data from the tunnel inside uh, or during inspection. And uh, as always, like, ROV also is equipped with a depth meter so we can uh, calibrate the data. Uh, the compasses and altitude, altitude uh, sensors. So we getting the positioning of the, of the, of the, of the ROV in the tunnel. And uh, all the data was <clears throat> streamed to the operator during operation and recorded for then later, later <coughs> uh, examination. So the uh, setup itself, um, so the entrance point was inside the, close to the, to the, to the dam itself. And the uh, entrance was from the intake uh, channel, so to say, uh, quite easy accessible uh, uh, inside this large building and with a reasonable size of the opening. So we could just lower down the ROV down to the water surface and, and continue inspection from there. So we established our control center inside the building close to the entrance and the operator uh, could, could basically uh, from that point uh, see through and navigate through the, through the inspection period. Uh, so what the results of the inspection were uh, that we discovered and observed uh, three major or major three uh, different uh, collapses in the tunnel. Uh, the first one was already at 200 meters, the next at about 600 meters and the last about 3.2 kilometers from the intake or the entrance point. So the, the tunnel itself, when, it's, uh, when it was uh, or at the beginning and outside those collapse segments, uh, perfectly nice shaped tunnel uh, with a clean surface on the bottom and no loose blocks, no kind of signs or indications of the, or the, or the potential problems in the tunnel. Uh, then we get to the area where we discovered the first collapse at uh, 210 meters, and that was issue in the in the in the one of the walls of the tunnel. Uh, there's a different image of the same collapse. Uh, so basically, the part of the roof and part of the of the of the of the wall started to collapse, and the material was accumulated at the bottom of the tunnel, but uh, still a kind of a Minus minor side minor part of the of the, of the tunnel collapsed and the water flow was still sufficient for the for for the operations. Uh, we also before and after that a little bit larger collapse discovered a number of smaller blocks from size to twenty to fifty centimeters in size, which basically indicated the ongoing uh, the 
ongoing corrosion or ongoing ongoing instability in the tunnel, uh, which causes uh, blocky fallouts with even the larger collapse in, in one of the walls. Uh, then we proceeded, um, the second collapsed and at uh, uh, 600 meters away from the tunnel. And also the part of the roof, part of the tunnel uh, started collapse and made a kind of large accumulation of the, of the debris on the bottom. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the size of it is maybe not the major, but just the process itself in that part of the tunnel basically indicates that uh, there is insufficient uh, stability in the tunnel on long term and something has to be done. And then of course, then we reached 3.2 kilometers in the tunnel. Uh, that's where we reached the major collapse segment of the tunnel, uh, where 80, 90% of the opening of the tunnel were collapsed due to the collapse of the wall. And that's an image from inside the tunnel approaching the collapse area. And uh, this is a side view of the same scan. So you basically see the interval here with the normal tunnel, uh, tunnel area and then the collection of the debris in the bottom. So basically 60-70% of the of the tunnel was totally blocked by the by the collapsed masses of the of the tunnel from the roof. And at that point the uh, decision was made that uh, opening was too small and too dangerous to to, to continue inspection. So after this uh, distance from 3.2 kilometers, we, uh, we had to make a decision and uh, go and get back to the, with the ROV to the entrance point and uh, abandoned, abandoned the, 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 the try of reaching the full length of the tunnel. So after this case, uh, when we knew that we have a major collapse at that area of the tunnel, uh, equipment was moved to the at the end of the tunnel, uh, where was a approach for the uh, swelling shaft, so to say, uh, the structure at the other end of the tunnel, and uh, a little bit different kind of approach, so we could get there with a the, with a crane and uh, low down the ROV to the water surface and entrance the tunnel that way. So continue the inspection from the opposite end of the tunnel, and if you remember, the tunnel was uh, drill and blast on one end and TBM tunnel on the other end. And from the other end, we could inspect the TBM tunnel, which was uh, in some segments was lined with the concrete lining. So uh, basically didn't show any, dim any, any, any damages or significant damages in the TBM segments of the tunnel. In some intervals was uh, possible to observe uh, some sediment collection at the bottom, but uh, otherwise uh, quite clean, nice tunnel. And combining all those two access points, uh, most part of the tunnel could be inspected. And uh, so a little bit of summary of that inspection uh, assignment was that uh, inspection of the headrace tunnel was was executed from uh, two different access points, uh, and 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 that could cover most of the distance of the tunnel. So the three different and some slightly major collapses were observed, and can be uh, situated exactly at the position of the tunnel and quantified and 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 analyzed from that point of view from the from the point cloud data. Uh, assumption or, or summary of the inspection was that the uh, uh, tunnel was constructed in the difficult rock conditions uh, and um, probably the insufficient tunnel reinforcement for these rock conditions was designed and probably was the reason for the cause of the collapse. Uh, uh, after further inspection and, uh, and analysis, on the data, we could uh, uh, consider or could could, uh, could identify that uh, swelling clays were present in the original rock of the tunnel was penetrating, and probably those uh, swelling clays was the the trigger which uh, which uh, which triggered the, the the collapse of the of the different segments of the of the tunnel intervals, and uh, with that inspection data and results, uh, the data of itself. Uh, then was used for planning and execution of the <clears throat> rehabilitation works in the tunnel. And uh, of course, those uh, larger collapse can't be uh, handled without the dewatering, uh, but uh, with the documentation which we were able to, to generate, the works for the rehabilitation works could have planned in the head and, and prepared for. 
and works could be uh, could have been was executed uh, a year later or the same year after the uh, dewatering of the tunnel and and, and, and reinforcement with a, with a new type of uh, reinforcement design. So that's basically an exact case of uh, what uh, what kind of uh, advantages of having a ROV inspections before. Uh, like a, like a first step of inspection of the tunnel, uh, in this case to identify the the problem areas, the type of collapse, quantification of collapse, position of the collapse, and and then do use that data for for preparational works for the for the rehabilitation works itself itself. I think that was the last slide from that point. Yes, so we are, I don't know how much time we have, but we are okay. open, to, open to questions and comments. Uh, there are a few more questions came up with. Uh, just check on them. Uh, to, to, let's see if you have much of information. To, 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 thank you. Uh, what are the possibilities to do underwater repair such works as application of protective coating? Short creating it, etc. As I said, uh, all, all showed we have some experience and tried, and it worked with a, like a removing of sediment and uh, indicating the leakages and doing that kind of work. Uh, applying the coating material or short creating in the in the flood conditions, I would say it's 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 hardly possible. Uh, with or without ROVs. So either coating or short creating need a dry surface to be applied on. And uh, I think in that case, it's the only way to do this type of repair is that you have to do the dewatering and get physically right there with the pumps and equipment to do able to, to do that kind of repair works. Uh, use of ROVs is relevant to inspect uh, the precast concrete segments of the tunnels. Uh, definitely, yes. Uh, uh, let's say, uh, for most cases, uh, the sonar data is maybe a little bit too rough to indicate small cracks or small damages. But uh, if you have a reasonable visibility, either with a, a video inspection data or with a submarine laser scanning, you can get down to the millimeter precision of the data. So to be able to identify the cracks which are important and reasonable to inspect the concrete segments. So uh, in that sense, you can do that, but uh, I would say only in the good water conditions or good visibility. So that will be maybe limitation. <clears throat> what is the technology used to maintain the vertical position of the ROV? And how does it move up and downs? Mm, Miko, that maybe you can explain better as a navigator and operator. Uh, how do we positioning ROVs and how do we operate or transport it? I think you are muted. All right, what is tech now used to maintain that? Okay, there's a thrusters, propellers, all the way. So it's uh, flying the ROV is the is the exactly the same than you fly with the helicopter. So uh, so it moves everywhere, every and there is a compasses and depth gauges which shows you how deep you are and how high you are from the bottom or that kind of things. And we are using a cable counter, so we know how far we are in a tunnel. So vertical is uh, easy to tell, how, tell where we are. And we yeah. have a, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think, we I think there was a question from Marosh. What is the mechanism to identify, uh, of identifying stress on rock mass using the multi-beam sonar? Uh, initial stress measurements or initial stress effect of the tunnel in the way I think it's 
uh, it's hard to identify that if you have one single inspection. So basically you can observe the, if you're talking now about the, the, the rock tunnels, you, you will get the momentum point of view or momentum geometry of the tunnel and, and can, can, can document it and analyze it in quite detail scale. To be able to have a kind of a impact of the initial stress in the rock mass to the, the geometry of the tunnel, you probably need to have a additional inspection of the same segment in the number of years or in the time period of time, and then compare two different scanning, uh, scanning data to compare them and see if you have a kind of deformation or, or movement of the walls to one or another direction. And that probably could be the, the only tool to, to identify the, the effect of the, of the initial stress in the rock for the, for the tunnel stability before it collapses or before it's, it's visualizes in the, in the loose blocks. Mm, what is the most yeah, preferable yeah. Water, water flow? Yeah, I said, ideally zero. Uh, maximum, uh, maybe, I know, what Miko, what, what is the bit largest flow you managed to operate? We have done in one kilometer's length of tunnel, we have done one, one meter per second. But if you have a five kilometers long tunnel, <coughs> so it takes, uh, it is quite difficult to go upstream more than one point zero point one. So if you have a small leakage in your gate, so it is okay. Yeah, I think that, <clears throat> that uh, we are not going to be in rock level electrical time stop. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we'll take up this last picture and I think some of yeah. the uh, effective, yeah. Lining method, yeah. I, I, I always it very much depends on the geological conditions yeah. and, 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 and size of the tunnel, but uh, it's um, either normal shot creating and, 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 and bolting or, or concrete lining with elements, either concrete or steel lining, I guess, a little bit, very much depending on the task and situation, uh, the geological conditions in, in, the, in, the, in that particular area. So uh, a little bit how to, how to answer. Yeah, and with that, I think uh, we can wind up the Q&A session. So uh, it was a very interesting discussion and we, we, most of us could get a good idea about the ROV applications in the tunnel DO inspection. Basically, uh, the inspections involve, uh, as we discussed, the DO ring it is the most uh, difficult part of the inspection program. Some time consuming and also the, the loss of uh, loss of loss of revenue. In addition to that, the main problem I see is this, especially in the case of an uh, online tunnel. It's a kind of a uh, stressing for the tunnel, a destructive test for a tunnel. So, yeah, as long as if we can avoid the dewatering, so much the better. In Sri Lanka, we have tunnels we have operated for 20, 30 years without a dewatering, but they are operating very well. Some are concrete line tunnels, some are uh, unlined tunnels. So, with the I mean proper monitoring, we could uh, observe their behavior. And also, I think with the RO, with the other one advantage, another advantage I see is once we do a scanning for, we can use it as a base baseline for future investigation. I think Andrew to emphasize on that. So that can be used for future investigations as well. So we can compare how it, is there a developing problem or uh, the actual the situation, the condition variation in the tunnel. So with that, uh, I think thank you very much. And uh, we will move to the next part of the formalities of the program. Manjula, you are there, I think. Uh, just to take opportunity, thank you very yeah. much for inviting once more, Kamal, and, yeah. and, and uh, very happy to participate. And yeah. I hope at least you got a little bit of glimpse and, and understanding of how that works if you haven't been in touch with that previously. And, and uh, if you will have any questions or, or specific requests, so please do not hesitate to contact me and uh, you can find our details on my homepage or on the LinkedIn side. And, and we have to comment and discuss some more specific particular cases if that will be there will be of, of your interest. So thank you yeah. very much.
Yes, thank you. And I have your contact. I can share with the others. And uh, how shall I, you are there? You can do the supportive vote of thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, I, I, I'm, I'm happy, happy to send you the presentation as a part of a PDF document. Okay, so then we can share if, with if, if you, Absolutely. You are, you please feel free to share with any colleagues, maybe which can join the, or want to look at it once more. So absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Andreas, and thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, yeah. thank you. Good evening, uh, Engineer Bhadra Kamaladasa, Chairperson of the Water Forum, Dr. Kamal Lakshiri, Chairperson of the Hydropower and Tunneling Subcommittee of the Water Forum, Dr. Andreas Rimsa, uh, and Miko Simola, our resource persons today, all the participants, dear ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to propose the vote of thank on this occasion as the Secretary of the Water Forum of IESL. Uh, I extend my gratitude to the speakers today, Dr. Andrea Srimsa and Mr. Mikko Simola, for sharing your valuable experience, knowledge, and opinions with us. Dear sir, it was an important and interesting panel discussion which helped us uh, to learn a lot about inspection and maintenance of uh, flooded rock tunnels using uh, this new uh, technology, which is 3D solar tailored remote operated vehicles. This technology is a new uh, technology for Sri Lanka. And I express our deepest sense of appreciation to Dr. Kamal Laksiri, chairperson of the Hydropower and Tunneling Subcommittee of the Water Forum for organizing this event and your active, active contribution to moderate this event. I also like to express extend my gratitude to the collaborators of this event, especially American Society of Civil Engineers, Sri Lanka International Group, and the Sri Lanka Association of Institution of Civil Engineers. And I am very grateful to the chairperson and members of the Executive Committee of the Water Forum for their guidance provided us for the success of this event. Further, I like to acknowledge my gratitude to engineer Manjula, the master of ceremony, for comparing this event. My special thank goes to the ISL Secretariat, particularly Mr. Chamila and Mr. Chamara for their support in making arrangements for this event. At last but not least, I'd like to express our sincere thanks to all the participants who are with us during this lecture today. I hope this lecture enlightened your understanding of this new technology. Thank you all again and wish a pleasant evening. Thank you. <laughs>